process development. This is the conformance information, you know, why we did this, how we did this. It's not necessarily the nuts and bolts details, but, you know, it does tell the, 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 the abstract story. You know, you should be able to read section S to six and, and come away with really a visual of what happened over the course of drug development. Welcome to CMC Live. This is the show where we discuss CMC regulations and guidances simplified through real-life experiences and risk-based advice. Each episode, we speak with subject matter experts as well as other leading industry authorities. With your host, Ed Narkey. Hello and welcome back to CMC Live. My name is Miranda and I am joined by Ed Narkey today. Today's podcast, I wanted to have to pick Ed's brain about the Regulatory Odd Couple blog series we have on our website. It is a seven-part series with two primer blogs, and there is a chock full of information for regulatory submissions in those. So today, I wanted to bring Ed on and ask him where he came up with the idea for the Regulatory Odd Couple, which is kind of timely, having Valentine's Day just right around the corner. So Ed, welcome to CMC Live. Please tell us a little bit more about the Regulatory Odd Couple, where it came from, and also I'd love to ask you some questions about regulatory authoring. Welcome everyone to CMC Live. This is our special Valentine's Day edition. Hopefully you'll be doing something interesting with a friend or a partner this weekend. So hello, Miranda, how are you? Yeah, and I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Do you guys celebrate Valentine's Day? Yeah, we love Hallmark holidays. It's really a great way to connect and know that we love each other on a specific day of the year. Great. Yeah. So it's getting less and less celebrated for the Narky family here for the last couple of years with the kids. You know, they now I guess we have to sort of support them with their their friends and loved ones, too. So but we have we have a couple of rituals. So anyway, it is the Valentine's Day 2021 edition. And I namely aptly named this one the odd couple. He's never developed a regulatory submission and she's never submitted one. So why are we doing this and what are we talking about here? So you ever wonder why you're spending the time and effort on generating this regulatory content that we all know that that's required, right? Requested by the reviewers and the FDA and EMA. The question is like, how many times or how often have you, have you wondered whether the reviewer realizes the impact of what they're asking for? You know, they're not familiar with your program, your, your process, your methods. Um, you know, their checkbox going down the list, of course, you know, it's very very important some of the requirements so you know we will go through this here in our in our podcast today we also have links to some previous articles written blogs and etc evaluating some of the more common issues that arise when sponsors prepare their their common technical document the module three and the quality sections and maybe talk about some examples uh some of the things that come up pr- pretty frequently that we've see and you know continue to see but i guess first off miranda The CT Module 3, for those that aren't familiar with it, right, it's the Module 3, for for example, specifically, it's detailed description of the CMC, the chemistry manufacturing and controls information associated with that drug substance and drug product. And your substance could be well-characterized synthetic molecule, new chemical entity, or, you know, something that's been around for a while, or it could be a biological uh, program or product um, that's generated from fermentation process. No matter what it is, it's it's the active ingredient, basically, that goes into the product and, you know, it creates the efficacy and, and those things like that does the job. So and that's formulated into a, pro- a drug product, uh, some sort of formulation, oral, solid, intravenous, um, injectable, et cetera. So, but anyway, all this information, right, provides assurances that the compound meets the requisite technical and quality elements it's the compliance pieces, right? And that all builds over the course of clinical development into a, a marketing application, you know, that's submitted for commercialization approval. So you can sell it. Usually that's probably where you're, you're going with this, right? Well, and there's a different markets, you know, there's different reasons to, you know, smaller markets, there's still sort of an audience out there, patients and et cetera. So, but all the compliance pieces are relatively the same. Um, you'll have your process information, you know, your characterization information, your st- specifications, which are, which are your, your analytical methods and your specs. So anyway, but we can refer back to that again here. The, but the, you know, the blogs, if you want to go back to them, you know, provide an overview of the same information, what has to be prepared, sometimes when we go through the common technical document structure, essentially, and tying it back into the odd couple, there's various, various uh, opinions on, 
what you need to provide, how you need to provide it, how much information, how little information. So again, I worked with a lot of regulatory submission authors in my career and there's different policies, there's different thought processes. You know, my only word on that is, you know, do what makes you feel comfortable and, and enter into the risk that you're comfortable with. So for example, I would say that, you know, you don't have to provide everything. Uh, that seems to be, you know, some folks preference. Sometimes that could lead to maybe just additional questions. You know, you're just kind of going too far, telling a little bit too much of the side story. And then giving no information is probably not a good idea either, only because it'll beg for questions, right? You're going to get additional questions. So somewhere in the middle, you know, sounds good. Um, I think when I worked at Larger Pharma and I was trained on this, you know, a little bit of information was not good, it, you know, somewhere in the middle, at least as far as I recall, you know, you have a lot more information, especially a big pharma, especially when you're generating lots of batches, lots, lots of um, data, you know, you can essentially hold a lot of information. And then, you know, you, you're going to know, get a feel sometimes where the questions could come based on your process or, you know, the complexity of the program. And it's when you submit a marketing application, it's, it's probably a good thing to take that data that you didn't submit. And then, you know, kind of almost self-answer questions that you can't anticipate, you know, get that data, put a story together in that, in essence, it's a little legwork, but you know, you'll have it ready when the questions come or if they come and, you know, you could, you could attack it that way. The challenge I think in our role here, Miranda is, you know, working with small biotechs, they don't normally generate a lot of data for obvious reasons, costs a lot of money, right? You have to pay CMOs, the contract manufacturers a lot to make batches. So, you know, you're really only kind of making and creating materials that you're going to use and then commercialize. And, you know, we've worked with companies often that are just, you know, three batches and that's going to be their clinical material. And that's going to be their launch material. And they'll do studies and stability studies and validation with that. So they may not, you know, have a full understanding of all the sweet spots uh, of the process or where the edge of failure is. They may not have done all of the, you know, factorial design work or the design of experiments. Usually that happens for those who are pretty familiar with drug development, you know, that happens early on in, in, in the background, sometimes informally scaling up processes. You know, if you're working in a process development lab, API scale up and drug product, the same thing. You're, you're going to do smaller studies to kind of get a, an idea and a realm where you're going to be. And then you, you'll eventually scale that up. So sometimes you can leverage some of that uh, lab work, that kilo lab work, some of that small scale production work, um, especially in the cases where you're, you don't have enough stability and you want to support that or show, you know, that the product is stable. And a lot of that could be used obviously in the clinical uh, ND uh, updated whenever you get new information or when things change. So why don't we get right into it though? So constructing the module three, a primer. Um, Miranda, you have any questions? Yeah. So where does somebody start when they are intending to file uh, NDA or a BLA? I think we come into it often when clients don't have a lot of data or they generated the wrong data. So what would you suggest to emerging biotechs to look at or think about first before even getting to this point? They're going to have to generate some data, going to have to author their marketing ap application. What should they review? It could be our blogs or maybe some FDA resources that they may want to look at before they get too deep into it. Yes, yeah, certainly if, if anyone's listening and not familiar with the drug development process, the one area, most important area is the FDA guidances, which are located on their, their website under the CMC area. And they cover small molecules and large. A lot of those are referenced to the ICH, the International Conference Harmonization. That's a, a body that harmonized a lot of the requirements for different regions to ensure that there's a consistency across the board. So usually they're the be all end all, they are on the ICH's website. You know, some of the things to consider early on are what you're gonna need at the end. So you're not gonna necessarily generate them step by step. Sometimes you'll actually even go to the agency and ask for some permission to not generate certain types of information because maybe it's not so relevant um, as part of the story. So I would say the the guidances and the requirements, the CFRs on the uh, FDA's website are kind of the be all, you know, the, their guidances are, guidances, but they're, you know, strongly recommended to follow, especially when you get to the point of filing a submission. You know, usually you're not going to be given an opportunity to turn any information in or provide anything after, you know, unless it's missing and that could delay your, your application, your, your, your review period. So one of the other things to think about, Miranda, though, is, and especially in our line of work here, is who's generating the information. For example, you know, traditional large companies may have 
facilities, headquarters somewhere, but facilities that they own and operate. You know, what you'll find in a lot of small emerging biotechs is they are a shell. They have a, you know, usually a management team. Usually they're virtual. You know, they may have some, some medicinal chemistry or research labs, but they're not doing most of the testing or the process. They're not creating the materials. They're, they're not doing, they're not operating under the QA. That's, that's usually done by a third party, a, a CMO. And as far, as far as that goes, the challenge there is uh, there's opportunity to generate the right information, but it has to be managed properly. So the CMOs obviously have uh, their business model is to create material for a certain price in a certain time frame to make sure that they have capacity to do that, fill the capacity, and then they're, you know, release materials to a sort of a legitimate specification to prove that they're making it consistently each and every time. So just to throw in here the the specification you know one of the main things is you have to make sure the materials are um, consistently made exactly the same most for the most part or they, they are the same at the end of the day. otherwise you have to run additional toxicology and safety studies and stuff like that so it gets into a much more complex discussion if you're talking with biologics so you know you're going to be reliant on your your vendor let's say to to generate this information so if you're not looking after them you know you're not kind of piecing you know puzzle pieces all on the table right if you're not looking at where things come in, you know, when they're needed, um, timing wise and stuff like that, you may run into some problems later on when you're heading into phase three and you're looking at filing a marketing application, because you may find at that point, you're missing some key pieces, maybe that you weren't familiar with. So any, you know, anyone that's uh, kind of putting in NDA together from the beginning, it's always good to have like a blueprint, you know, map basically to see where things are coming in. Sometimes data comes in the very last minute, you know, sometimes the last day actually. So, you know, you want to leave placeholders if you're a regulatory person um, at a small company, you know, you, you want to make sure that there's awareness of what, what's going to be your bottleneck, et cetera. So. That's actually a good lead into the next part of it. I was doing some submissions for a company and we were always waiting on the quality overall summary. Is it advised to wait to build the quality overall summary or build it as you're doing your sections? Or explain a little bit more about what that is if people don't know. Yes, this is another one of those odd couple situations, you know, like he says this, she says that, and they're not in agreement. The quality of our summary, again, just for, for those who don't know or are not so familiar with it, it's, it's sort of a high-end summary, you know, of basically a quick synopsis of your, your program uh, that goes into module two. But, um, you know, it's, again, arbitrary. You know, you can wait till the very end. If it's a straightforward program, summarize things, put it in there. You know, I myself was taught to do it a little bit differently. You know, that's the cookie cutter model. You know, you wait till the end. Nothing changes at the end. You put it together. You, you basically just put a snapshot, redact certain things. Certain things aren't necessarily necessary in this QoS. But I, I look at it a little bit differently, I guess, from my trainers or my mentors and teachers out there from back in the day. I look at it as it's a good place to explain the things that are missing or not necessary and then why certain guidelines were not followed so if you lose, use that as a rule of thumb you know you you probably could start to develop that story as you go along as you have fda meetings and the phase two meeting for example and key one you know if there's binding agreement that you don't need to do certain things that's maybe where you cite your your discussion your compromise there with the agency in there, you know, to kind of re remind them and maybe relate back to where that uh, dialogue and correspondence was documented. Also, for example, there's certain things you're you're not going to do with certain types of drug formulations, uh, certain types of APIs. Might be obvious to reviewers, but you know, maybe that's maybe where you explain that. Sometimes you're missing data and you just don't have it. You know, you're not going to have it. A lot of times, programs are put on hold or shelved for a while for reasons such as running out of money resources, you know, maybe there's just too many products in the pipeline, some things are put on hold, and then they may license the product out to a different company, a large company maybe, or small, and you're not going to have some of that back information, that inherent information. Um, you may not be able to go generate it. So that's where I think some of that missing pieces can be explained, you know, scientifically, of course, you know, you just can't say that you don't have the data, right? So, and then, and there's there's no need, yeah, to, to, to kind of pick it up here. There's no need to submit irrelevant information in there, redundant information, unorganized information. So again, just my opinion, you know, you, you as with everything, you want to start somewhere, somewhere if you have a goal in mind where you want to be, even if it's just creating a shell for the quality overall summary, putting in place markers where, you know, you, you may not ever generate that information. You may essentially formulate into your questions, you know, for an FDA meeting or an EMA meeting, you know, and that could be the basis for your briefing book, essentially. So, 
So there's a lot of sections that go into a filing. Do people particularly start at a certain section or does it depend on as, as data comes in where they want to start? So if somebody was building a marketing a- application, where would they start? Do they just start at S1 or P1? Is there any guidance to that or just does it depend on the author? I think it depends on the state of your program, where you're at. So if you don't have a a thorough process that's established or scaled, you're going to have limited information. You know, you may have some batch records and some slight early development reports on the process, but those things would probably have to be increased or some more data. So you're not going to work on those sections. Certain information like uh, the, the nomenclature, the molecular structure, the formula, the molecular weight, those are things that won't change. Once you identify and characterize your product, your API, you know, these are things that, that are, are static. They're not going to change. So these are also things that are in your IND. You know, these are requirements for your IND. Um, now, you will get other information, characterization type of things, melting points, you know, hydro, hydroscopicity type of information, partition coefficients, you know, if you have different types of, some of that stuff comes in later, but you're going to have a basis. So when you submit an IND, as, as we know here, you're going to have general information. You're going to have basic information about the manufacturing process, you know, who makes it. How is it controlled to, again, like we said, consistently produce it, right? Some characterization uh, information, you know, the, the, uh, the, the entity, the, the molecule is probably going to be elucidated by some sort of analytical technique, whether it's mass spec or, or LCMS or, you know, various types of uh, different characterization. These are all in the guidances, by the way. There's, you know, a wish list of things that you can use. And then some companies also use some new technologies to either save time or further characterize to reduce question. And then you're also going to have some information early on in your IND around the potential impurities identified, you know, and you're going to characterize them and qualify them for safety as you go along. You're not going to know all of them. You're, obviously, your methods aren't going to be fully validated. You may not have all your methods in place. But to answer your question, I guess, to, to a lot of the information that you would kind of put into an IND that's required just to open an IND and then as you evolve into phase two and three, you'll have some of that stuff set. You know, you'll have that there. So you can either expand on it or some of the sections will almost kind of be complete, you know, from the from the IND stage. Container closure, for example, if you're using a vial, uh, you have a, a cap, a seal, the gla- type of glass. If there's no anticipated changes to a different delivery route, that would probably be sufficient. And that's that section's kind of almost done. You know, you're, you're gonna have additional studies that you'll do on the container closure to ensure it's consist, you know, it's consistently uh, keeping the, the product under control. But those are things I think you add, you can even add into other sections. But a lot of these sections have a basis. You're going to have specifications, your acceptance criteria, right? Your methods and your spec. You're going to have a baseline of, of methods. Um, we covered that in a blog. I think it was c- control of the drug substance, I think it was. But, you know, it kind of lists, outlines some of the kind of general specifications that are just always required, are always are required. And then you're going to have, you know, as, as you develop this more, you're going to want to find out, you know, control a little bit more, scaling up, you may have to tighten it a little bit. You're going to have a few additional methods. Some of the methods that you'll, you'll use early on might be primitive, TLC and those type of things like that. As you get down the road, you know, sometimes it's more costly to, to develop a little bit more of a robust method. So you'll do that later on uh, when some of the, uh, the risk is based out, you know, when you have some efficacy data, you know, you're taking the product forward into a marketing application. But, um, you know, stability data as well, you know, you're going to be generating that over the course of your clinical development program. It just doesn't happen overnight in, fa- you know, the last day on phase three. You'll generate that your formal stability studies at some point, and you know re, that you can support your retest and your expiry date there. That's going to be, come in, you know, over whenever you take the the readings every three months or once a month, depends on what you know accelerated studies. So you'll have some information that just continues to stream in, some information that just is dumped on you. You know, you you engage a CMO to do a sort of a development study for certain reasons. A lot of those studies that are required information for the pharmaceutical development section, the drug product happen that way. You know, you'll, you'll put effort into studying a certain aspect of the formulation um, or the delivery system. And then you'll have all that information. You'll be able to put that together whenever you're ready. You, you can certainly wait till the development report, you know, the marketing application is, is going in, but you know, usually you want to put it together and start to build that. Sometimes people leave companies. Fortunately, that inherent information might go out the door. So it's always a good thing, at least in my mind, if I'm managing a, a CMC group, you know, regulatory CMC group is to, to kind of collectively start to build that again, story as you see fit. Now, if there's no one to do it, well, that's, that's a problem, right? If, or if you don't know how to do it, that's a problem too. So again, it's, it's kind of one of the reasons why there's consultants out there or staff, you know, we can bring in some mid-level staff too that have probably good 
foundation and ideas on how to build filings. Um, some people like to write as well, and some people are really good at it. So I would like to talk maybe some of the sections here, Miranda, in no particular order, you know, and this is just kind of coming up in my head here, but these are blogs that we kind of took out and put some information in. So characterization is kind of, in my mind, one of the fundamentals of a product and a process and a program. If you don't know what you're dealing with to start, then it's hard to you know, catalog it, make it consistently. It's hard to answer questions if there's any analytical data that show there's other stuff in it. It doesn't have to be 100% pure, but there are factors as far as impurities and those things like that. There's legal limits that, you know, once you run your preclinical study, you can have some dirtiness in there, you know, some impurities, but, you know, you, you can't go backwards. You can't have a pure compound and toxicology and safety study or uh, preclinical studies and then scale up your process or change your process where it's you know, very different impurity profile. Because then you can't, all the attributes that are in there that you can't determine if there's safety issues or if that even affects efficacy. So, you know, my advice on that one is, you know, go go with the dirtiest material you can in safety studies and, and toxicology work. Not too dirty, obviously. There's some standards out there you need to follow. But, you know, and then try to improve your process after that. And by improving your process, having better control of it, maybe adding additional steps for purification, you know, you'll, you'll come in with a little bit cleaner material that certainly should fit under the safety guidelines that you've established by the toxicology. So that said, sponsors have latitude, you know, to how data is presented, what's presented, like I mentioned, and how important messages are formed, formulated there. Um, and that comes with data. So if you have some data, you can tell a good story. If you don't have data, you make up a story. I'm kidding. You don't make up a story. You know, you have to have some data, honestly. And then where there's holes, you know, you have to be able to explain it scientifically. Or, you know, you have to maybe commit to doing additional work. So it's a gray area. I won't get too much down that wormhole right now because every program is different. Talk scenarios forever here. But as far as authoring, you know, that that characterization section, there's standards. We talked about this a little bit just a moment ago. Nomenclature, structure, general properties. These are things that are established probably early on, sometimes years, you know, years before uh, and when the programs are just sort of initiated in the research uh, clinic. But, you know, then you'll get into some of the more novel things, the elucidation of your structure, which, you know, occurs at some point. And then your impurity profile. And, and that also kind of streamlines into your process. You know, you're going to want to know your impurities before you you know, get too far in establishing your process or setting your process. And that could be in the form of your organic impurities. These are, you know, start, remnants of starting materials, any byproducts from the chemistry or if the fermentation process, for example, on the other side. Intermediates, you know, that might be sitting there. Degradation products, that's another, you know, they could be organic, probably are. Any reagents that you're going to use in the process, catalysts, ligands, those type of things like that. You know, you're going to want to make sure that you have a consistent material at the end of the day. And you're also going to have an inorganic impurities. These could include reagents as well, catalysts, obviously, heavy metals, uh, salts, other materials, also filters, charcoal, you know, things that fell into the reactor. I have good stories about working on a CMO where, you know, accidentally things fell in and, you know, you're going to make sure you'll pick those out, but you'll see those. Would recommend going right into there, uh, looking at some of the rec recommendations that they suggest, you know, again, making lists, seeing what you have, and then plotting these into some sort of plan, you know, where you're going to do certain things, you might want to generate some impurities, you know, um, which could be ultimately become your reference standards and stuff like that during your process, you'll have to isolate them. So it goes into that, um, that whole mix. So the, the next area, and this is probably in some folks' mind, the most important, it's arbitrary, they're all very important though, it's the manufacturing of the drug substance and the drug product. So if you don't have a process, you don't have a product, right? Things don't just appear out of thin air. We have countless stories about, you know, different, different types of chemistry, different types of fermentation, you know, changing cell bank, then having an upstream process that's, you know, severely affected, the titer could be affected. So there's, there's a caveat of different things. And it's, you know, we can use the analogy, it's like baking a cake and the cake should look the same at the end, but um, maybe a little bit more uh, complicated than a cake uh, baking. So just to, to highlight some of the areas of the drug substance, you know, the manufacturer is, is pretty well established. You know, you'll be required to put some information in there that certifies who they are and if they're GMP and where they live and et cetera. But some of the other areas are important too. So you'll, you'll want to describe your manufacturing process. You'll have a process flow diagram. That's probably one of the most basic functions, a flow chart summary, right? 
And then you'll have this in, in the beginning when you submit an IND for the most part, but then you're going to build a story around that, right? It's, it's a very creative picture and shows what the chemistry looks like, but some of the questions that you'll eventually start to address in a submission and write-up where necessary come out of the work, the development work that you do. So, you know, you'll want to talk about robustness of your process. You know, do you have reworks? Are they common? You know, how do the physiochemical profiles of um, multiple lots compare? You know, this is where you start to bridge characterization specifications with the process. This could be a topic in its own right, but critical quality attributes, CQA for critical intermediates and final drug so, substance, right? For, for drug substance side, right? You know, what are they? How did you define what they are? Why are they critical? Are they critical? And then and that certainly goes into having critical process parameters associated with these uh, CQAs, you know, and is there data to support this association? So all that story has to be put together, you know, has the commercial synthesis been defined? You know, there's usually there's very little changes later in the process, but sometimes there are uh, for different reasons, mainly scale up and cost and those type of things like that different you know you move something to a different facility perhaps there's equipment that's different so you know there's subtle changes there could be it's not advised to make major changes towards the end because there's just a lot of bridge work that has to happen and, and creates a lot of angst right you'll want to again start to think about this you mentioned earlier you know when do you start to think about things when you start to write things you know as you go through it as your business model comes you know as you know how much material you're going to have to you're going to need to commercialize you'll ask your self these questions, you know, your batch size, is it, is it commercial, right? Suitable process hold points, those things like that. Th these are things that you'll, you'll learn down the road, right? As you do some of the development work, you know, how, how, how have these been determined? When should they be determined, right? Some additional questions that, you know, you might want to discuss internally with your CMO or just your, your, your staff, you know, are the reagents, where are they coming from? We have, I guess, in the midst of a pandemic here, there's supply chain issues, not just with furniture, refrigerators, uh, kayaks, and those type of things like that, that I kind of found in the last year. But, you know, sometimes starting materials even, sometimes reagents to use in the process, right? So along the lines, you'll, you'll eventually build inventory, you know, pr prior to doing this process. So that shouldn't make a big difference, but there are supply chain issues, you know, and then, then going down to some of the control of these materials. I can't emphasize this probably enough, and I think most folks probably are aware of this. Regulatory starting materials, where does GMP, the good manufacturing practices, start, right? So reg, reg starting materials, you know, it's defined as the point where the sponsor commits to these GMP uh, process. So you can have a 20 step synthesis and you may only be required to have GMP in the last three steps. And in that case, you're probably going to look at your process and say, hey, we have such a clean process. We get rid of everything impurity wise in step two. And then the rest is just chemistry. And there's no, you know, that opposed to if you have a three step process and, you know, the last process is still a bit dirty. Same, same goes there. You know, you really want to find a, a, a point where you can establish where, you know, if anything changes prior to that, it shouldn't affect going forward. So, and that includes changing reagents, changing starting materials. Um, you don't always get the same starting materials from the same supplier. You can have early in phase one, you can get your materials from, let's say, India, from XYZ CMO. And then because of the cost of goods and a couple other things, maybe supplier or just um, naturally the amount that you need, you, need, you may get some different materials from Europe. And the chemistry to build those those starting materials may be completely different, you know, different reagents, even different chemistry that can create a different impur uh, impurity profile. So if you think about it, common sense is like, if you have a different profile of some of those things, carrying that through to your API, you're going to have potentially different activities. You know, you're going to have side reactions. You might have different material. So if you can determine that you can use anything from anywhere at this point, doesn't have an effect on the final product based on your specs and methods, you're probably in pretty good shape. And to make a long story short, you know, that's probably where you would establish your, your starting material, where it gets for your starting materials. Also in this section, you know, the, the manufacturing section of substance end product, you're going to describe your analytical methods. You know, you're going to have interim methods to test intermediates, you know, different, different steps of the process. And it goes for a large molecule as well. And sometimes they're just as critical as your final methods and specifications. And then in the write-up here, you know, going back, I, I have to remember the odd couple here, you know, questions that you'll ask and the, the difference is how you display them or how you convey them to the uh, FDA in a, in a filing and could give them a little bit and kind of certify it and hold the rest for questions where you can put, you know, a little bit more information, especially if your process is suspicious or, you know, it's just kind of tricky, you know, where are the process impurities generated, which parameters influence these levels, right? You know, how are the parameters that influence this product, the quality here controlled? You know, do you have a good handle on that? Are they, are these tests reproducible? You know, you're going to get the same thing every time you should, right? And then are there, you know, 
any correlations between these process controls and the critical quality attributes that we spoke about. So that's your control of intermediates. Now, perfect timing, Miranda. You know, we, we you mentioned something, you know, when do you do certain things and write certain things? Process validation, and this goes for substance and product. Uh, you know, the the cottage industry, you know, declared many years ago that the that it was, you know, you need three validation batches. That's that's set, right? Yet nowhere in the regs, as, as far as I know, does it say you need three batches? It may say it's some paper. I don't know. Actually, I have to look back into this, but I don't think in the guidance is that there's any statement on number of batches. Typically, three is a good number. You know, it's, it's not two, it's not one, and it's less than four. Validation work costs money and time, and th- those are things, you know, com- you come to play. If you can do something three times in a row consistently... You know, generally, that's that's validation, right? But this this is where you know you, you you won't be talking process validation for a while. You'll have this in the clinic, ministering to patients, getting to a pivotal study before you do most in most cases validation because you're not going to spend the time or money on on this you know until you know you have a viable product that can be commercialized. So, but at that point of validation, there's a lot of fancy guidances out there, um, a lot of large pharma um, sort of helped build some of these ICH guide guidances because, you know, there's a lot of process and formality you can put into them. The truth is though, small emerging companies don't necessarily do that. You know, they, they have a requirement to do process validation and they do it on a budget and, and pretty efficiently, you know, based on the requirements at the end. So this usually happens in phase three, you know, somewhere along the phase two, you know, you're, you're going to generate a validation master plan or protocol that has the objectives, the scope, responsibilities outlined. You're going to work through this with your vendor. You're going to come to some agreement and certify this. And then you're going to you know, exercise it and, and, and do the process validation. But in that process validation, you're going to, again, critical process parameters, right? These variables. And then the uh, associated CQAs you're going to sort of measure and follow. You're going to want to document this uh, during validation work. So that could be phase two, but more or less it's sometimes phase three. And I should bring this up. Sometimes in certain per- with products, you know, there's no validation required until you're actually going to ship the product. So it doesn't necessarily have to happen prior to your submission. It could happen during your review. It just has to happen at a certain point. And there is a guidance out there that's slipping me right now. It, it kind of sort of outlines this. It's actually not a guidance. I think it's actually a, um, it's part of the CFR that gives a little bit more information, but check the F- FDA's website. I think we mentioned in the blog too, but it talks about timing. You know, we obviously want to push off most of this work that costs money until you're f- fairly far into your your review because, you know, you, anything can happen in a review. Uh, most folks try not to do validation too much prior to your submission. Sometimes they do though. Sometimes the validation batches are your stability batches. Sometimes they're, you know, part of the, the trial, the, the phase three. It depends on really how many, how much material you need, the population that you're going into, all those things like that. And then, you know, one of the other things, again, and just to finish off the substance section here, the process development. This is the conformance information, you know, why we did this, how we did this. It's not necessarily the nuts and bolts details, but, you know, it does tell the, 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 the abstract story. You know, you should be able to read section S to six, and, and come away with really a visual of what happened over the course of drug development, you know, from the beginning actually too. So, you know, as certain things fall off or become irrelevant, you can take them off, but it's a great thing to have a story. You know, we started here, we did this, and this is the reason why. Now we're here, we did that. And it, you know, it culminates with that section. You can glance over at your process, some of the other sections in there and you go, oh, okay, now it makes sense, right? And then um, same thing, you know, I'm a substance, drug substance person by training background, so I sometimes forget the drug product, but um, same thing, you know, you have a manufacturer there, you're going to have a batch formula, you're going to have the same type of things in the description of the process, you know, the, the flow summary, right? And then you're going to build some of that information. Uh, talk about your process controls, you know, same thing with critical attributes and parameters and those things like that. You're going to touch on any information on excipients. This is a big thing for the drug product uh, outside of the API. You know, these are pieces of uh, materials that are put together in the formulation to either keep it stable, to deliver it, you know, various functions. These are not part of your original API, right? They're going to buy, you're going to buy these. You're going to want to make sure that these are, you know, legitimate, um, safe, and those things like that. Again, a lot of information on excipients on the FDA's website, and we did have a nice section on our blog. And then just to quickly finish off some of the for the audience here, critical steps and process intermediates, same type of thing as I mentioned, I don't want to keep going through this with the uh, substance, but uh, a little bit different, right? You're making something, you're putting into a vial, there's there's a little bit different than just the chemistry in, in a sealed uh, reactor, right? And then the validation, process validation, same thing, you know, you're going to have timing on that. You, you may not do that until after you submit your marketing application, but there is a requirement to provide 
you know, have a protocol on site to, for an inspection. And then ultimately you have to deliver some of this data to, to launch the material, to sell the material. Yeah, that's definitely the largest section for drug product and drug substance. A lot of information goes into making those. Yeah. So we talked about the excipients, right? Do do you have any questions on excipients? There's I think I have a lot of questions for myself here. Yeah, as far as excipients, I mean, I say do your due diligence to make sure that the excipient, like you said, is qualified and up to the standards of the FDA EMA. Don't just take their word for it. Make sure they have documentation on that. I believe excipients do or do not require a drug master file, Ed? They might have, yeah, there's there's drug master files for filed for excipients, and that's a quick way to reference the uh yeah, exactly. So then they should have an open section that you could review and look at that and utilize that for some of your backbone for your excipients. Right. And then you'll you'll get spec there'll be a specification, you know, acceptance criteria. They'll have specs and methods. And, you know, these are not necessarily critical to the drug sponsor, but you know, whoever manufactures them, it is critical to them. And again, going back to the consistency of what you're providing, if you're buying something here, you know, if you, there's changes to it, you know, but through a process or just a level of impurities and stuff in those excipients, you're going to want to take that into account. So again, same, same thing goes along the lines and we'll get to the control of the drug substance and process and product sections in a bit. But while we're on excipients and since you mentioned drug master files, there are a few caveats to excipients. So like one of the things you'll probably want to, you know, kind of recognize it's a question that will probably come up. So, you know, you'll want to know it, you know, are they human or animal origin? You know, this, this has a big bearing on the safety profile. So if they do come from animal origin now, it's, it's infrequent that they come from animal origin and maybe your human origin, but sometimes they do. Um, and then the other side of it is the other big thing for excipients to think about is if they're novel. There's a quite a nice description on the FDA's website. You know, if it's an um, excipient that hasn't been used in another product, which happens um, for various reasons, you know, it may not have been necessary in other products, but there's a new route of administration or type of uh, NCE that would require a different type of excipient. And also levels, you know, sometimes the levels are established in certain programs if you're dumping in twice as much or you know whatever you would have to take that safety consideration um so just a whole litany of things to think about if you have novel excipients and you know basically the uh, definition is new excipients are or novel excipients or any active ingredient or inactive ingredients should i say that are intentionally added to the therapeutic you know but they're they're not intended to exert therapeutic effect you know they're not an api and they're they're not fully qualified by the existing safety data uh, with respect to the current you know proposed level exposure that I mentioned. So you'll have to do additional safety studies, and there's there's additional work that's going to have to be required. So if you have a novel excipient and you don't have a drug uh, master file, in most most uh, submissions you'll have to create another module three, you know that has the same type of information, the uh, the process to make them, the control of them, how stable they are. You know, you'll you'll have to put a little more effort and write up into some of that if you have a novel excipient. So that's one of the things to ask yourself early on. So the analytical control section and the analysis and reference standards, I'll kind of hit these all one one sitting here. We started to make some references to some of this, you know, how you control it has to be the same every time. You know, so the the link between this product specs and methods and stuff makes intuitive sense, right? You can't change one can't change without affecting the other. So obviously if you implement a different method, you know, the specification will be different. And those are things that I think that, you know, it really depends on your program, but quite important. So product specs list of tests, references to the procedures and associated acceptance criteria. It's a range or a level. Other standards that are, are used here come into play as well. So, um, and, and some of these are related to the critical quality attributes. Sometimes um, a, a critical quality attribute is a specification. To kind of kind of go through these, uh, typically there's there's a list of things just associated with any type of product. For example, you have a well-characterized small molecule that's made by a chemistry process, a synthetic process, right? You're gonna have a quantitative statement or description, you know, it's this, it's this color, it's a powder. Those are things, just a quantitative description that you know, you're gonna to wanna to put together. There's other things that you're gonna have and that's based on you know, your, your program, but identification testing, there's a few requirements. You're gonna require two, two separate specific identification tests and usually they're run by HPLC, one of them and an IRR method. They're very established analytical technology and methods out there. You know, and the most common specification is your assay, which is essentially it's the level of your active. So 99.99 is always a good number, but uh, you know, there's ranges. You can have something or a spec set at 95 to 105. Uh, again, this goes back to qualification of your material and the safety studies. 
how reproducible you know your your process is, manufacturability. You're going to want to kind of come close, you know, to that same assay uh, each time. If there's variance, you know, obviously you're going to have questions. And then the other part of the methods, I think, for most programs is the HPLC. That's the basically your liquid chromatography uh, to to basically measure your impurities. You know, you're going to want to scan your your product to see what's in there, right? So you're going to have different methods there, mainly HPLC, and and these all pertain the assay HPLC. ID testing quantity. These are pretty much for all programs, but you know, a lot of actives might be different. Some instances you'll want to measure particle size, melting point, you know, LOD, loss on drying. You know, you want to do Carl Fisher to see how much water is in there. Sometimes it has effect on the drug product and formulation, right? You'll you'll if it's the solution, pH, you know, any microbial limits when you're talking about, you know, maybe maybe this is more on the drug product side, but if you have a sterile product, you know, you're gonna have different specs in there to control that to ensure that you're not getting microbial effects or any type of that that type of work. You know, the rest of the sections, again, don't want to speak too much about analytical procedures and validation. We do have a podcast, right? Um, where we talk to Coleman Byrne and analytical, and it's really great. Uh, he, you know, kind of gets 30 years of experience with um, working with procedures, validation, you know, the hiccups that happen sometimes. Some of the other areas that are required in these sections are batch analysis. So you'll have a sort of a history of all of your all of the materials that you made, you know, kind of with all the information, the lot number, what the date, where it was made, a scan, you know, you'll have the assay for each of these. You'll have additional information like the impurity profile. Um, I have a great uh, visual. I don't know if I can share it here, but I put this together probably in the early 2000s, just an evolution. I worked at a large pharma and there was probably over 15 years, there was 50 batches made. And you can see the evolution of, you know, very simple specs up in the beginning, very little uh, information, very, you know, additional testing and stuff like that. As that was scaled up, as that was transferred and, you know, multiple sites were making it, you know, assay become became much more specific. You know, there was actually a second assay, an orthogonal assay that was generated. But you could see additional information was tested over time. Additional methods were put into place. And in some instance for stable product, you can, you know, run some older material in current methods with current specs to see where things come out. A lot of times, you know, some of the API does have a shelf life, so it may have degraded over time. So you can't tell if it is the same, um, but you could certainly show that, you know, this, if it is, then you, you have a pretty stable process. One of the kind of most important, in my opinion, in this section, at least, um, and we could do a podcast on this one as well, and kind of one of my favorite actually ever, just because it's, it's so interesting how you can put this together. Justification of your specifications, right? You can have specs, big deal, right? You have to be able to justify them, especially if there's questions. So these will these will provide, you know, justification provides comprehensive control and uh, you know identity and purity and things like that. So early in development, they're controlled. You know, anything like this, any of these specs are controlled by a qualification, qualified qualified method, and then you want to validate that. So in phase three, you're going to have you're going to have draft final specs, and um, they should be justified regarding the historical experience. So all that work that you did, you know, up until that point has to be integrated, the manufacturability, why you chose certain methods, why you set specs, et cetera, right? And at phase three, you know, the drug process should be well-defined and not open this changes. So that's where you're going to establish your, your, your reasoning. And since specs are chosen to confirm the quality rather than to characterize the product, the sponsor, you know, should provide the rationale. So just to finish off that, you know, consider answering these questions, you know, are the specs linked to a manufacturing process and why, right? Are, should they account for the stability of the drug substance and how do they? Are they linked to the preclinical and clinical studies? You know, are they linked to analytical procedures? So if you have a process and you have stability data and you have, you know, preclinical studies, you can relate all this, you know, the story back to that, right? So yeah, we set the spec because blah, blah, blah. We had preclinical studies that were in this range and et cetera. We did qualification studies. You can set them based on the sensitivity of your methods, your procedures, those type of things like that to show that they're they're set properly. And you know, the manufacturability, that's one one reason I think I can throw in here that you don't want to set tight specs too early because as manufacturing changes, you know, you may find yourself out of spec. Um, so that's just part of the process. And then you know, same thing applies again. I probably don't do a drug product sections justice even though i wrote tons of them i just never really worked in the manufacturing area but you know you'll have the same specifications there you'll have uh description identification assay impurity profiling right and then you'll have based on your based on your dosage form your formulation different types of uh, additional specifications disintegration dissolution moisture again viscosity again you know those are volume of fill 
and those type of things like that. Same thing with the procedures here. You know, it's very similar to the substance. Sometimes the methods are the same as the substance. If you're measuring the assay, for example, you may have the same method in place or the impurity profile, the same ones in place. Maybe a different way to make the, um, the samples, maybe some different reference materials or different instrumentation, but you know, along the same lines, you're trying to control the process. End product testing. We can get into this on, in another area. Um, end product testing is, is really the game. It's quality by chance, as they say, QBC. There was an initiative a number of years ago. It's still in play, I guess. The quality by design is, you know, testing product quality and, and consistency in, into your process, right? So this way you're not surprised at the end. It's quite expensive though. There's a lot more work and data that needs to be generated. Um, so typically folks still fall back on, you know, that that final test uh, series of specifications and methods. If you meet that, you know you're good. But we'll we'll talk in maybe in the future about the evolution of that. And then the same thing, justifying those specs, right? We talked about that. You know why does this have something to do with the process? You know you set it this way because you can consistently make it this in this range. Does it have something to do with stability? Are some some of these methods and and, and specs are stability indicating? A lot of the methods I. Was going to mention it earlier or later actually but you know a lot of the same methods are used and specs are set and for the stability so as long as you're measuring this over time you know you should stay within those ranges and i'll just touch lightly on reference standards you know very very important fully characterize your reference standards or elucidate the structure as, as early as possible and and save a, a good amount of the material because that's what i found in my career you know there's always missing or we ran out of uh, reference material and that becomes a bottleneck and you have to make more is it the same as the original one and if you have different reference materials you know over time it's hard to correlate data previously you know you're going to have some variability there so that's about all i want to say on on the analytical process section again some folks think this might be the most important i think there's relevance to say most of these are, you know, depending on what technical functional background you are or where your holes are. You know, I, th I think that's one thing maybe kind of we can agree on. The most important sections are where you have the least amount of data. So, so container closure, packaging of the substance in the product, you know, quite important because you're trying to keep consistency. If you have powder, you know, lying around, if it's hydroscopic, you can pick up moisture, it could degradate it, whatever. So, you know, typically you're going to have in, in the API form, you're going to have a bag, certain type of material inside of a drum, sometimes sealed. Sometimes these materials, these APIs are light sensitive. So you're going to have different types of things. And then on the drug product side, you know, packaging, primary packaging is your, yeah, if you have a vial, something, for example, like that, it might be a second put into a secondary packaging, again, maybe for a light sensitivity. Those are things I can cover here briefly. Do you know anything about packaging or uh, do you have any questions on... About packaging in particular, I mean, drug substance, I don't have a lot of experience with. I know that there is various different drug product packaging that people want to consider, depending on the product, of course. If you're talking about an injectable, of course, that would be a glass vial, but... When it comes to certain types of plastics and stuff, I know that there is leachable issues, stuff like that, and, you know, vials to consider and the headspace as well, stuff like that. From my understanding, you have to really think about the container that you're going to use to house your drug and make sure it's compatible with your drug and doesn't affect your drug. Yeah, so for the substance, like I kind of described, there's a, there's a drum, there's a plastic insert, you know, keep keep the dust down or whatever. So, but you know, you're going to want to provide a full description of the primary packaging for the substance and the product and the marketing application, you know, how it's stored, where it's stored, what the components are, the materials, the chemical and the physical reactivity of any substance, you know, it's kind of dictates the type of packaging needed. So, I won't go into it, but if like I said if it's if it's absorbing water, you know, there's controls that need to be in place if it's light sensitive obviously right and then you'll you'll you also do some minimal identification testing on this packaging but i'll leave that to another time secondary packaging and touched on that um same with same with the drug product you know a cardboard box is considered that secondary packaging if it provides protection to the product test results of any stability studies has to be done in that in that type of material in the container closure to show that that's actually helping with the stability and you know kind of makes sense right i don't know if i have anything earth shattering around container closure I, I must say this is one of the more dull sections in my brain you know from working on it very very clean cut not to mean it's it's simple i mean you know obviously if you're going from a, a sachet to sort of a bottle or if you're putting something in you know some sort of different packaging and trying to correlate to, you know to some original early development work it's it's tedious something that can't be taken lightly you know changes any any changes to anything um, in the program process wise or control wise late in the game is it could be a problem right because you're going to have to generate additional data because there's an unknown you know what does that change mean right so but that's that's kind of uh the synopsis there's quite an extensive uh bits of information on the ICH website on container closure and it is a nice segue into the stability uh section which you know I think 
probably pretty important. You know, that's one of the main questions that you get. How much stability do we need, right? You know, well, it's just it's established. You know, you need two years if you want a two-year shelf life. If you have one year and, you know, maybe you have a little additional information that you can extrapolate, maybe you get some buy-in. I think the thing is that more importantly is, is when do you have that data available? So stability is one of those sections where you do get a little bit of leniency where you can add a little additional information at some point during the review without um, putting the review on pause or restarting the review. So you're going to want to have, in my opinion, you know, at least one year solid stability with your methods, validated methods in place, you know, just to show some authority. And then you're, you're going to want to have additional um, stabilities to support extending that. So you, if you have a product that's been on stability for four years and it's rock stable and you're using the same protocol and the same tests, and that, you know, you might be able to get away with being able to um, submit, you know, just, just one year or maybe less, but it also depends on the nature of the product. If it's a must have, you know, unmet need, maybe there's some leniencies. A lot of times there's not though, you know, it's, this is where a conversation with agencies is important, you know, letting them know that you may not have enough data, but you'll still be uh, generating it, you know, that sometimes there's binding agreement that that's allowed, right? Sometimes you are allowed to maybe make a small update in your uh, filing once it's under review. And I've been, I've been involved with some circumstances where because of the, the important, such an important nature of the product, you know, such a population that's affected, that's, it's just, there's nothing out there for them. It's called breakthrough designation. Uh, there, there's an allowance to maybe file information in your IND under, you know, as the file is reviewed, just to show that there is consistent information generated to show that this, the product is stable. And if you're able to get that agreement and you can, you know, update that IND over the six months or nine months to, um, you know, as that review happens, it gives some assurances without affecting the FDA's PDUFA process, right? Because anytime there's new information, there, you know, there's a kind of, sometimes you have to go back to the beginning review things because it does change the way the reviewer looks at things. I know, I know you, you love this conversation, Miranda. I just keep talking about, you know, submissions and what goes in them to a high level, on a high level at least, right? Um, it would take a long time if we really get into the weeds, but that's why we have our blog series. So, you know, anybody that's interested, maybe take a look on our website and kind of check out some of the things. We don't have case studies on there, but I think I have enough elements that I pull from guidances and just experiences that could give you a sort of a high level roadmap. Um, and also contact us, you know, any, any burning questions, you can certainly have a consultation and talk about our experiences. So the last but not least is the composition and the pharmaceutical development modules. And these pretty much relevant for the drug product section of module three. So, you know, again, you have latitude on how this data is presented, especially in P2, your pharmaceutical development section. Now to touch on it, your composition is just a listing of your active and anything in or associated with your drug product. And, and that includes sometimes processing agents, but mainly it's your excipients and it's your active form. You're going to talk about maybe some of some of the ingredients, any solvents uh, that you use in the process, you know, how the formulation was categorized, the functional aspects maybe of each component, you know, why are they in there? And they're, they're reference points, you know, if to for a viewer to examine, you know, to get a better understanding of how the product works. So any understanding of the, these components, you know, allows for data-driven risk assessment during the, the review. And then when we were talking about functional aspects, I guess I can define that a little bit better. Four basic categories, right? Are they there for the stability of the drug substance? You know, are they there as physical characteristics to help that, that? you know, do they help with absorption maybe, for example, or manufacturability? You know, some of these are putting uh, into certain, you know, tablets and capsules, for example, emulsifiers and, and those type of things to help build the actual formulation, right? in the process. You're going to want to discuss any impact on stability. New formulation, maybe there's some impact, right? Some some of these uh, excipients are stabilizing agents. And, and as I mentioned, you know, how does that affect the actual product? You're going to want to talk about the physical roles, the excipients and any in vivo effects. And then you may have some in, uh, excipients that you're using in the manufacturing process. Again, this is kind of just a one to three or five page sheet that's just going to have a summary of what's what's happening, right? So let me turn my attention to in some people's mind, the most important section, uh, P2, pharmaceutical development. And I'll try to give this a little bit justice here, but um, not being a pharmacist or formulator um, or a pharmaceutical scientist example, I can't get into this technical function. You know, I, I, I can tell you exactly what everything needs to be in there and what that data is, but I haven't made any of this 
my career. I've relied on a lot of other folks, folks that we work with today that, you know, have been formulation scientists or pharmaceutical scientists for their careers. So, you know, this section provides any science, you know, science background rationale for why you have that formulation, you know, uh, through the final development and justification of that, that dosage form that you're talking about, right? So any discussion in this section should cover, you know, your solid or your liquid, if whatever we want to have, including parenteral formulations. Guidances describe some, you know, they're only really limited detail of what the requirements are. So it's really more of a story. It's like the manufacturing development section of substance. It's really the story of why you chose this formulation, how you make it, what went into that, you know, how, how it's going to affect patients based on how it's delivered, you know, how it's going to be affected in itself by being stored over the long periods of time and, and, and the such. So you'll have a discussion around the components. You know, you're going to talk a bit about the drug substance. You're going to tie this back to your drug substance sections. You're going to talk a little more extensively that more, more of the conformance information about excipients, you know, the excipients, if they're, if they're grass, uh, generally, generally recognized as safe, your excipient section, like probably should mention this, the, the mention previous mention of excipients was really the nuts and bolts, how you make them, how you control them. But this is really why you're using them, you know, how you're using them and those type of things like that. You know, I, I won't get too far, but you know, this, this P2, you have different story depending on your formulation. You know, if you have a solid dosage form, you're going to want to talk about incompatibilities of the substance, you know, and the functional groups and the excipients if they exist, you know, any reviewing any fundamental chemistry and the excipients, if there's any activity there, you know, are any of the potential incompatibilities apparent, you know, or transparent, does that affect the quality, right? And then you can get into solid state reactions and those type of things like that. So it really depends on if your dosage form. So if you have a liquid, you're not thinking anything like you would if you had a solid form, right? In this case, you're going to talk about different things, you know, solvents that you're using, thickening agents, chelating agents, antioxidants, for example. So, um, so for liquid formulations, compatibility studies also occur. You know, how do, how do they interact with those type of things like that, right? Powder fill systems, like what, what do you want to talk about there? Something about your, your process, right? Compatibility again. And then we mentioned, I mentioned this a little earlier, sterile, sterile products, you know, liquid dosage forms. Stability is pretty important, you know, when you're autoclaving, but you're, you're going to want to come up with well-documented development efforts and information, you know, to defend the need for any, uh, for a formulation that can't, you know, be sterilized if it's heat sterilized and, and how that affects the quality. And then for non-sterile liquids, you're going to want to ensure again, like I said, the earlier, the acceptable microbial bio burden, because, you know, you may have a safe and efficacious medicine, uh, but, you know, if, if it could potentially harm you because it has microbials in it, that's probably not a great thing, right? P23 manufacturing process development. Um, you know, this is again, like the uh, related substance section, you know, it's going to be a discussion of the, the process development, you know, why certain things were made. This is the conformance section again, versus like a compliance section, which is the description of the actual process. So you'll talk about your experimental designs here, you know, your understanding of the process, any attributes, again, critical ones as well. And then you could do a hazard analysis or, you know, the, those type of things to find uh, criticality. Uh, this is where you would discuss any reworks you know, how that operates, how that happens versus throwing your materials away. You're going to touch a little bit more on container closure uh, in P25. Again, we talked about the comp compliance section, you know, here's your vial, here's the specs, here's the seal, here's the cap, here's what they're made of, et cetera. You know, for here, this is where you're talking about if, if it's if it's an ox oxygen or a moisture sensitive product, you know, you're talking about the package, why you chose it, you know, that provides the effective barrier, right, and et cetera. So this is the conformance section. You'll touch on the microbial attributes and the cap uh, the compatibility as well in this section, and I won't get too much into those those areas. So. So Miranda, there you go. There you have it. The odd couple, definitely different techniques and, and philosophies and cultures out there. So, you know, you have to do what's best for your program. You have to be able to sit in a chair and defend it when you get questions. I guess the main thing is you try to avoid any questions. So on that note, hopefully you have a, a wonderful Valentine's Day this week. You'll see lots of red, I'm sure some, some places. Anything else to finish off with? No, that's, that's it. Thank you so much. And I see you're wearing red today. So it works out well. Of course. For folks who can't see me, I'm wearing all red except for my hat. So uh, let us know what you guys think about these topics. Again, as always, we love any feedback. You know, hit us up. We love your comments. If you have them, get in touch with us on their website. You know, we laugh. We like to make friends, et cetera. You know, very important note as well. You know, please subscribe to our channel. If you already haven't, you'll get notified immediately when the, the premiere of the next uh, CMC Live is out. It's, it's one of the only forums out there that I know that we talk about things, you know, engage with us, perhaps, you know, send us questions. You know, I, I love to get the chance to chat with uh, most uh, folks at Merging Biotechs out there. I love doing it. You know, I love learning about their programs and I love sharing my experiences. So likes go a long way. You know, we want to build more likes. We want to build, you know, more of a resource here. And we, uh, you know, see see most of our other content prior uh, podcasts on YouTube. Great reads, great listens if you have them. Tell your friends about the channel. 
Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your podcast. We're going into our second season. So any ideas that you have, you know, send them to us. We can bring in the right people. A lot of good technical folks here and also, you know, our network outside in the industry that we'll, we'll start to build. So it's an amazing thing. I'm having a great time. It's Valentine's Day, Miranda, right? Celebrate. See you guys next week. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which include a summary, timestamps, and any links mentioned in this episode, please visit dsinformatics.com forward slash podcast. There you'll find the information from this episode and any past episodes. If you're enjoying this podcast, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash cmc live. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.